Okay. Apparently, I got to do some other stuff on the way here. do that. Well, hopefully that'll be fine. <coughs> oh, that's interesting. Okay, I'll try that again. Okay, uh, so we're going to look at a collection of graphic design that is inspired by and makes reference to classical typography. Um, and if it wasn't readily apparent, this slide uh, makes reference to classical typography, but obviously there's some elements of it that are uh, not necessarily wrong, but trying to do something different with it. So there's like, the, there's trying to get that kind of diamond hourglass thing happening, uh, but instead it uses this sort of brutal, chunky 19th century typeface. And then instead of some elegant ornament in the middle, there's this like, digital magenta dot. Um, so uh, I think, was there Jan Sichold examples in the talk I gave last week? I feel like maybe the very last thing, if it was like from 1941, was a Jan Sichold thing. And there were a couple of examples from his book. So a really famous example of work that was influenced by Jan Sichold, and therefore classical typography, was Peter Saville's work for the first the Factory Nightclub, and then later Factory Records, home of Joy Division and New Order and whatnot. So I think this was the third poster he had done for uh, the Factory, um, and it has a very clear debt to, uh, to Sichold and classical typography. Though on the other hand, what's kind of interesting is that um, I think Sigil might still have been, or Peter Saville might still have been a student when he designed this, this is from 1978, is that uh, he didn't have any context for the work he was looking at because uh, what he was learning how to do in art school in England in 1978 was make like tacky airbrushed illustrations. And he didn't know there was a library until his senior year. So he goes in and he digs out all these old books. And one of the things he discovers is the designer Jan Sigil. And, uh, I just listened to an interview with or an interview with him and Tony Wilson of Factory Records today. And when he went to meet Tony Wilson for the first time to find out if he needed any posters or anything, he didn't bring any of his own work. He just brought the Jan Sichel book and said, I want to make stuff like this. Um, and they sort of agreed upon it. And so this is one of the early pieces. Um, and I think the things you see that are really different is like much less sort of size shifts. The use of like negative space is a lot different than the stuff that we looked at last week. And also, it's, it's actually like kind of tight 70s tracking. It's not that open, spacious, let the type kind of recede into the background. Um, and it's also like kind of like it's much darker in tone by being white on black. But on the other hand, the references are very clear. Um, I included this one because it's actually kind of funny. It's not designed by Peter Saville because um, as Tony Wilson, who was not a designer, said, bad copy of Savile style done by ourselves because we couldn't wait any longer. Uh, so if you've ever seen the movie 24 Hour Party People about uh, factory records, the first poster that Peter Savile does, the event happens and he shows up after the event with the poster and says something like, oh, the yellow was impossible to get right. Um, <laughs> though it turned out that that was actually like the second of four events, so the poster was only half useless. Um, but uh, so this is a good example because he was a perfectionist. So they just had to make something and they basically ripped him off. So they're like ripping off Peter Saville, ripping off Jan Sichold, which is kind of funny. And as a result, they sort of get it wrong because they're also referencing another Sichel, uh, Peter Saville piece that's much more modern and, uh, and uh, asymmetrical. So they actually like took two chunks of what Saville was doing and then jammed them together, which is kind of like makes its own new interesting thing. Uh, here's another Peter Saville piece. This is a Joy Division substance record from uh, 1988. And in here we see the, the details of classical typography coming through much stronger, right? Like we've got, it's starting to be like tracked out. 
is in the old uh, old style lettering where like the numbers kind of are uh, offset from each other to bring a little bit of dynamism in them. Um, and then what's neat though is that he also brings in this, which is a super futuristic font uh, designed by Vim Crowell in the, I'm trying to think it was the late 50s or early 60s that was based off this idea of a grid. Um, and it was designed, the idea was he was gonna design like a computer, even though he didn't have access to computers. Um, but Peter Saville goes and like thinks that this is the perfect marriage of like old and new. And this is to me a really good example of, um, it's, not, it's not a pastiche of classical typography because there's other conceptual ideas happening, but it's taking these things and jamming them together to try to get somewhere new. So it's like this neon technical green futuristic thing up against this super classical beautiful type. Um, this is just a sort of funny coincidence. This is a book cover, or the whole book is designed by a studio called Yes. This is from 2009, but strangely it's designed by Yes with Peter Saville. I didn't realize that until after I pulled the image off their site. Um, and it's one of these things where it's very like basic, right? It's like centered type, but once you start to look at that history, you realize like how much we're indebted to it, how much we like see it happening all the time. And with trained graphic designers, uh, you don't, you're not taught in school like, oh, what's the most beautiful way to make center typography? You do a lot of experimentation and a lot of like pushing things to the edge. So, um, so it's really common to see certain types of work not by designers will be centered. Um, but a lot of designers will resist that because it's like too old or too stodgy. But sometimes the tone is just perfect. They're like, they have this kind of gray on gray thing happening and then you have this very severe all caps thing and it's like it's not as traditionally beautiful but it's got a kind of dark somberness to it uh there's a series of like virginia wolf covers by angus highland these are from 2011. so um so basically it's a five books i believe each one has this different painted cover with this particular type treatment and then here's the the covers once you take off the dust jacket um, one thing I think it's worth pointing out is I'm selecting work that, that has references to classical typography. I'm not, I'm not saying, oh, everything H Angus Highland does is this sort of neo-retro thing where he's trying to make work that's like got a, a, a taste of the 1800s in it. Um, but it kind of floats in and out of some of these people's work. So with Highland, <laughs> this is like... When he deals with historical authors, he oftentimes digs into these references to classical typography. And you see like these very kind of beautiful spatial relationships. Little tiny bit of like a, it's a very cleaned up version of it. This is another Angus Highland. This is a uh, making of Fantastic Mr. Fox, uh, Wes Anderson movie. Um, I'd say the references in here are like even uh, clearer, like the type is laid out centered. It's got those kind of relationships, like here's the publisher down here. We have that second, you know, we have the three blocks, right? Title, credits, publisher. Um, and that's followed throughout, like, uh, and, and in here, I think he's trying to get at something like Wes Anderson makes these movies that feel kind of older and everything in them that happens, like, you know, I can't remember the, what period the Fantastic Mr. Fox is supposed to feel like, but it's definitely not 1990 or 2010 or 1980. Um, so uh, we look through this book, like you, this kind of off-white paper, this really, it's hard to see this um, typographic ornament in here, but it's a dot with two lines off it. It's all very elegant. And you can even just like, when you, if you get a chance to look at the details of the captions a little bit, they're very bookish looking. Um, I don't know what happened to this one. I guess I moved something in the wrong spot. This is a Christie's magazine designed by Spin out of London. This is like pretty new work. Um, at first you look at just the covers and they don't necessarily look super classical. Like the Christie's logo is the Christie's logo and it definitely has that air already. Um, and then they bring in just this really big bold sans serif type, kind of an interesting font. Like the R is kind of funny looking and the G is kind of neat. Um, but it's once you get into it, everything is laid out on this kind of centered axis. Um, and they did it in phases. So these are from earlier issues. 
Um, and then later, even the captions are centered. And the whole thing, like it's a classical book design applied to sort of more complex contemporary needs. So they're doing interesting things that play with it, like these kind of funky um, custom fonts for major articles. And like, instead of a very tasteful rule line, there's more like a thick, uh, it's almost like stay the hell out of here line. Like, just, let's make sure you understand that this stuff is separate. This is a poster by Emily Anderson. Uh, I think this is a good one where it's like, it's, there's a sense of elegance to it. And I think that elegance is the things that are references to traditional typography. So it's all caps. It's almost on a centered axis. Like it's not quite, because it's actually more like it's on the left-handed axis with these big tabs, but it kind of feels centered. And then, uh, and we have this sort of serif kind of book typography throughout. Um, and it's like the kind of thing that if this was set in Helvetica, it would have such a different tone and it would feel so different. Even if it was the same color, same interesting kind of treatment, it would have a very different feel to it. And I think um, it kind of shows like how, how much the typeface and what you do with it, how much that counts towards something. Because we might look at the same thing and think it looks like a 60s pharmaceutical ad if it was in Helvetica. Uh, this is some work by Nonformat. This was really funny. I opened up Nonformat's website today looking for an older project that was like a redesign of a fashion magazine because um, this sort of aesthetic is all over fashion, but I was having no luck finding anything the minute you need to. Uh, but this is the newest project on their website, and it doesn't really look like any of their other work. And it's like, it's got all these sort of gestures in play, like we have that sort of open tracking. They push it further by using this interesting custom kind of stencil font so that it really does look like the type is sort of melting into the page and everything throughout this piece is on a centered axis. Uh, and this is another recent non-format project. Apparently I, uh, oh, there we go. Um, I thought this was, this is another project I think from this year. So it's uh, a book by a, I think it's Norwegian, comic actor, comedian, etc. cetera. Um, and each page is this very like detailed typographic image, I guess we could say. Um, but I think you can see like the DNA of it is in classical typography. Like it's kind of a Bodoni that like kind of a Bodoni Baskerville that's buried in here. It's sort of on a centered axis. It's very much defined by the normal edges of like, like how a paperback, or not a paperback, how a, a novel, that text block would be kind of set. So it's like a, it's sitting there under the surface. Uh, and then I included a couple of my own pieces that, um, that I know 100% that that's what I was thinking about. Um, so this was like an early thing that we, did for the soap factory for the show, The Erasers. Um, I don't remember if we started with the type or we just started with a block. I think the idea was um, that, uh, if anyone's familiar with a, a piece called Erased de Kooning by Robert Rauschenberg. So in the 50s, he asked the sort of master abstract expressionist, Robert Rauschenberg, for a drawing that he could erase and that was gonna be his piece once he erased it. Uh, and so, I guess in my head, this is the frame that he put it in, and then this is the erased de Kooning. I, it's four years and my brain is foggy about any of this, but the typography was um, definitely influenced by this sort of like trying to make a very beautiful kind of classic type arrangement, but it also was based on a conversation with the, the executive director of the soap factory about how much we liked factory records. Um, this is like a more recent thing. It's a series of posters for like monthly series of posters for <coughs> lectures and discussions here. And the concept was to make something that took um, very functional information design. Like, it, like everything is just about dates and the names of things and simple descriptions and organizing things clearly. And then trying to make it look very bookish was um, really the entire concept. And, now, and this was the first thing we did for the soap factory. Um, and, uh, 
And I don't remember how I explained it, but I do remember that then the executive director said, oh, it's just like factory records. And we're like, okay, perfect. Um, mm -hmm. So it's like, that's kind of in there. And also my own interest in the classical typography is kind of in there. And there's like a reference to um, very uh, industrial typography in terms of the font. So it's kind of like layered in there. And, it, and of course it has a different meaning to me than to someone who maybe understands that like there's such a thing as center type, but not necessarily like that it's 500 or more years of like history about typesetting and design or whatever. But uh, I kind of like the idea that at the very least it's kind of in there hiding for me. Um, and then this is the last thing. These are like a series of studies that I kind of pick up every so often where I'll just find a show listing in, um, <coughs> in the city pages and I'll set a timer for 12 minutes. I think it's a, I think it's pick, set a timer for 12 minutes and design a flyer for it and do two versions. Maybe it's set a timer for eight minutes. Um, and it, and very often they play with, um, the idea of like centering type, uh, and like, ha and like, can something look classical even though it's not, even though it's like very simple, like structural typography, it's really just these two indents with these subsets of information but like, can you use the font and kind of make something look classical when it's not, or find a marriage between like very structural dynamic typography, but then use a kind of old fashioned typeface. Um, so it becomes like an ongoing area of study for me. And I think one of the things you'll kind of see is you start to notice this typography crop up more is how often um, designers are trying to figure out, is it possible to have centered elements in something that's more modern, because the minute you try to put something centered into an asymmetrical composition, or you try to make it work with things that are also left justified or right justified, you realize how much the centering, that like a centered chunk of type, it wants all the space because it like works so differently. It doesn't have clean lines. It doesn't make edges as clearly. So it's a very interesting place to kind of fight with type to figure out like, can I get control of this? All right, so that is a thing of a somewhat traditional typography, and I will um, I will send that to you. I'll send the PDF to you guys tonight as well. Bye bye, internet.